Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining for this first of our five webinars in our Looker Toolkit series. My name is Mare Newton. I'm the Customer Education Manager at Looker. And today, my fantastic team member, Emma Ware, will be taking you through table calculations. Before joining the education team, Emma was a member of our Department of Customer Love and handled hundreds of customer chats. So she's going to share some really interesting table calculation use cases and provide some great tips and tricks for troubleshooting table calcs based on her chat experience. Speaking of chat, there is a chat panel within this webinar that you can feel free to use for any questions that you have, and we'll try to address a few of those live at the end of the session. This webinar is being recorded, so we'll share that recording with you after the webinar is over. With that, I'll hand it over to Emma to dive into the content. Hello, everyone. So as Mayor mentioned, I'm a part of the customer education team here at Looker, but I did get my start as a chatter in the Department of Customer Love. So if any of you have been on chat in the past, perhaps we've had the pleasure of talking. Um, just a little bit about me. I am the proud cat mom of a very large Maine Coon cat, although I'm pictured here with my coworker's kitten. And my background is in physics and astrophysics. So why do we care? As a data explorer, have you ever wondered how to divide two columns or rows in a data table? Or have you had the thought, my analyst hasn't built out the field that I need for my report that's due in an hour? And for the developers in the audience, have you agonized over needing to add fields for a specific report, but not really wanted to clutter up your model with too many of the one-off additions? Well, if any of these scenarios seem familiar, then table calculations may be the answer you're looking for. Table calculations provide a lightweight, quick, and powerful way to transform values in the data table. They work pretty similarly to Excel functions on a spreadsheet of data. So these calculations are run on the numbers that we see in the table, meaning they do not involve sending any new queries to your database. Table calculations are useful for answering one-off questions or applying transformations to the front-end data that might be complicated to do in SQL. Developers can use table calculations to effectively help keep the model clean by only defining fields that they want to reuse multiple times. Let's take a look at our agenda today. We're going to start with our goals and an introduction to the building blocks of table calculations and starting with some simple sum functions. Then we'll move into if functions, which we'll use to create conditional logic in table calcs. And then finally, we'll do offset and pivot functions and wrap it all up at the end. So what are our goals? Our goals are to get comfortable creating and troubleshooting table calculations. As I mentioned, I joined Looker in their Department of Customer Love, and the chat team there has seen their fair share of complex table calculations. I want to share some of the tips and tricks that we use to break down functions as we write them. All of today's examples are derived from real-life questions that we've gotten on chat. So these are things that people are really implementing in their data and may have use cases in your own uh, explorers as well. Our last objective is to cover how functions can help us navigate around the data table. For example, if I want to grab the no value from 2016 and divide it by the yes value from 2006, how can I accomplish that? This is a frequently covered topic on chat, and once we're comfortable moving around the data table, it really opens up a world of possibilities. Uh, one important thing to keep in mind is that table calculations can only use fields that are already included in your result set. So we would only have access to the fields that are in this data table. Uh, so if I need to get a sum of 1,000 values, we can use a table calculation because that will fit in the data table. But if I needed to get a sum of, say, 100,000 values, which is too large to return in my explore, I might need to get a developer to write that as a field in our data model, not as a table calculation. So what are our tools for building table calculations? Our first stop shop should definitely be the Looker Functions and Operators documentation shown here. 
This lists all the available functions to use as well as links to example articles for many of the common functions. So if you're ever stuck on what syntax a table calculation expects, this is an excellent reference. As I mentioned, table calculations can only use fields that are already included in the result set. So we need to make sure that we add all dimensions or measures to our explore before we start writing. And within table calculations, there's an edit modal seen in the bottom screenshot here that provides a quick help guide that can help us with any necessary syntax and inputs for all functions. So let's jump into Looker and see what editing capabilities table calculations looks like live. So in the Explorer we'll be looking at today uh, comes from the U.S. Census and contains data about age, salaries, all kinds of demographics, and voting habits as well, which you can see over here in my field picker. I run a simple Explorer with the dimension registration method, which lists all the different registration methods people have used to register for elections. And I have my measure, number of people, which shows the number of people who register for each method. So I've got my two fields that I'm interested in, and I want to run a simple sum that adds up all the values in this table. Again, much like an Excel sum, sum function. Let's go ahead and add a table calculation. So we start by clicking on our calculations option over here. Uh, some of you may have heard of or be using custom fields. Today we'll be exclusively focusing on table calculations. But a thing to note is that if your admin has enabled custom fields, you'll find the option to add table calculations over here in the field picker. But let's start by opening up our calculations modal. We'll do a quick tour. You can see we can start by giving our calculation a name. This is important to name your calculations clearly to describe what they do because anyone who views your report is going to see this on the front end in the table. So because I mentioned I want to do a simple sum, I'm going to call this total number of people. We can apply a formatting. There's a bunch of default formattings to choose from. Because I'm doing number of people and there are no partial people, I'm going to go for decimals with zero decimals. Down here is where we're going to be writing our calculations, and there's a simple example here to get you started. We can uh, so if we begin typing, you'll see that a list populates with all of our different functions as well as quick descriptions of them. I know that I want to do a sum. So I begin typing and it populates sum and over here is that quick help that tells me what I need to add. You'll notice that the function is currently underlined in red. That's not something to worry about. That just tells me that I'm not done writing my function. It requires one argument and I haven't given it any. So to see what fields are available to use in table calculation, Type a dollar sign to narrow down that big list of functions to just your fields in the table. So I see I can take a sum of the registration method, which is not quite what I'm looking for. What I really want to do is take a sum of the number of people. To reference a column in a table calculation, we use the looker substitution syntax with this dollar sign and bracket. For any developers in the audience, this will be a familiar pattern. This is also how you write in LookML. We'll be using that little dollar sign trick a lot today as it really speeds up creating your table calculations. So let's go ahead and save this and see what we get. And you can see I've got a sum of all of the number of people in my table as its own column. In an explorer, columns with table calculations will always appear as green. So how many of you have ever used a sum if function in Excel? The first function we're going to look at today is an if function, and it uses similar logic, where we define a condition that can be either true or false, and then assign outcomes to the true and false condition. 
I'm going to go ahead and open up a fresh explorer so we can start using our if function. So a question I see in the news a lot is millennials wages this, millennials job earnings that. I want to know how are millennials and Generation X doing financially compared to previous generations? I have a field here called generation name. And down in my job category, I have a measure called average yearly earnings. I'm going to go ahead and add both of these fields to my Explorer and hit Run. So we can see here a breakout of the generation name and average yearly earnings for each generation. I want to be able to compare Millennials and Generation X to the other generation's yearly earnings. In a table of only four values, we could do this visually, but imagine that this is hundreds or even thousands of values, which is why we need a table count to be able to quickly pull that comparison. So thinking about it logically, I only want to show the income if generation is millennial or generation X. Let's start writing our table calculation. I'm going to start by giving it a name so anyone viewing my Explorer will know what I'm doing. And I'll call this, let's see, earnings, millennials, and generation X. I'm going to go ahead and apply a formatting because I know that this is money, so I'll be using a US dollars format for that. And as I mentioned, we're going to start with an if function. So I type if, and here's my little uh, quick help on what it's expecting. So first value is a yes, no expression. Then the value is yes. So what do I want to do if it is what I want? And what do I want to do if the value is not what I want? Our first condition is our generation. So I'm going to pull up all of our available fields using the dollar sign. So I want to look at the income if generation name is equal to millennials, or if that generation name is equal to generation X. So there's my first statement. Again, don't get spooked by the red highlighting. That's just telling me I'm not quite done yet. So I've given it that first yes, no expression. So if either of these are true, I want to return the average yearly earnings. That's my yes condition. If the generation is not millennials or generation X, I want to return a no because I'm thinking down the road, I might want to take an average of these. So I don't really care about the non generation X or millennial earnings. Let's go ahead and save the table calculation and see if it's what we expect. So, yep, looks good. We've pulled out the earnings for, for the generation X and millennials. Again, I kind of want to group these two together and compare them against the rest. So I'm going to reopen my calculations modal and choose to add another table calculation. We can keep adding calculations this way and edit them from this modal. So my second calculation, I'm going to call this mean earnings millennials and generation X. Again, I know that I'm working with dollars, so I'm going to go ahead and choose this. I like to apply a formatting beforehand if I know what the output will be, just so I don't have to go back and fix things later. And now I want to take the mean of, so notice when I type the dollar sign to pull up my available fields, there's a new field that's available to use in the table calculation. And that's the earnings millennials and generation X, which was our previous calculation. Using this dollar sign bracket syntax, we can reference previous calculations that we've made. So instead of retyping all that logic that I just did, I can simply reference the earnings of millennials and Generation X. Let's save this and take a look. Excellent. So now I have a column that gives me the mean earnings of millennials and Generation X. Once I have this value, it would be pretty quick to find, say, a difference between the average yearly earnings and the mean earnings, and I could see who's making more, who's making less. Right now, it looks like 
millennials bring the bring the earnings down a little bit for the average, but everyone's still doing still doing better than the silent generation alone. So this is helpful, but I want to hear how an education affects these earnings. Growing up, I'm sure many of us have heard that if you want a good job, you got to get a degree. So in this case, I really want to look at generation name and education level. So I have this field, education for categories, which I'm going to go ahead and bring into my explore. I'll add that field and run it. And you can see now that we've broken things out by generation name and the education level. And our previous calculation is still working. So it's only pulling out the earnings for millennials and generation X. But now I want to apply that second condition and only look at the earnings if they're generation X and they have a bachelor's degree or higher, or if they're a millennial and have a bachelor's degree or higher. So let's go ahead and go back to our calculations and start another if function. We can call this college educated earnings for millennials and Generation X. Again, working with dollars here. So I'll go ahead and change that formatting right away. And I'm going to start by typing out another if statement. This time, the condition that I'm interested in is if the, using dollar sign to pull up, education is equal to bachelor's degree or higher, because this is the condition in my table. So that's who I'm interested in looking at. Now, what does this for the yes condition? So I could kind of repeat the logic I have up here and return the average yearly earnings. But I also want to check if they're millennial or Generation X. So for this yes condition, I'm going to reference the earnings for millennials and Generation X. So this is sometimes called a nested if function because we're checking two conditions. We're saying, first check, do they have a bachelor's degree or higher? If they do, excellent. Let's move on and check if they're millennials or Generation X. If both of those things are true, let's return their average yearly earnings. So this is my yes condition. And it would be possible to copy and paste this logic into here to create a single condensed function, which is what I would recommend doing once you're happy with what you have. But while we're still testing and building, I like to break things out into every individual step along the way to make sure I'm getting the result I expect. So we have our condition for this if. We have something that we want to do if they are that education level. And again, if they're not this education level, then I don't really want to see that earning, so I'm going to add a null for the value if no. Let's go ahead and save this and see what it looks like. So excellent. I have now narrowed it down to only the values I'm interested in, which is millennials and Generation X for a bachelor's degree or higher. I'm going to kind of repeat a step I did earlier and find the mean, because I want to be able to compare this as a group against the rest. So mean, college-educated earnings, millennials and Generation X. Once again, this is in dollars, and I want to take the mean of, and you can see all of our previous calculations are now included here, mean of college-educated earnings, millennials, and Generation X. Let's save that. And there's our end result. So we can see, I'm actually going to go ahead and hide these intermediate columns so we could get a little clearer picture that a college education certainly does make an effect. It, it has almost a $24,000 a year effect. I'd say that's pretty hefty. And we can quickly compare across how is each generation and education level doing compared to the others using our nested if functions. 
going to hop back out of the product for just a moment because now we are going to move on to our offset function. So now that we've got ifs and conditional logic under our belt, I want to talk about moving around the data table. So offset functions are used for row over row comparisons. In this simple example I have here, we can type an offset, the name of a field we want, and a number value of how much we want to offset by. So if I put an offset of one, that will grab the value one row below. Time to jump back into Looker so that we can do a little more exploring. So I'm not gonna clear this explore because I like it. I'm gonna open up a brand new one. And my question is, so we know a college education helped, but has this always been the case? Is this a more recent trend or has college education, college educated salaries always been higher? And how have they changed over the last 20 years? A couple of things to note here is that I've added a filter because we're only looking at bachelor's degree or higher. So I'm gonna filter all that data to bachelor's degree or higher. And I wanna go ahead and add the year and the average yearly earnings field so that I can get a sense of how those earnings have been changing over the past year. And I'm gonna go ahead and sort by year. So here we go. I want to do kind of a year over year, row over row comparison. So in order to do that, I'm gonna to need to grab the value from the previous year, which is offset by one. I used to teach math and I found that the best way to get my students to remember a percent change formula, which is what we're gonna go for here, is to remember it as the new value minus the old value divided by the old value or no new minus old over old. And this was how many of them felt about math. So it stuck really well. Let's go ahead and find that calculation by opening up our calculations modal and starting by giving it a name. So I'm going to call this previous year's earnings. Whoops, there we go. And again, we're working with dollars, so let's go for dollars. And we're gonna start kind of like we saw in that simple example by typing an offset. So once we type off, we can start to see all of the different options. We'll address some of these a little later on, but we're going to start with a simple row offset. Takes two inputs, my column and my row offset. So the column I'm interested in, using the dollar sign to narrow that down, is the average yearly earnings. And I want to offset that by one row. Putting a value of one row here will grab the one row below. If I had an offset of zero, it would grab the current row and an offset of negative one would grab the row above. If you're ever unsure, check out our documentation or my favorite method, which is play around with it. So let's save that. And perfect, exactly what we wanted. So I can compare 2016's yearly earnings to the previous years. And we're gonna use this to calculate our percent difference. So opening up calculations again, this is the pattern we're going to be using, lots and lots more calculations. And we're going to call this percent change in yearly earnings. Again, clear name, help anyone viewing your report. This is what will show up to anyone who's viewing your explore or look or dashboard. So name things clearly. This time I am not going to be using the dollar format because I'm calculating a percent change. So I'm gonna go ahead and select percent two, which means a percentage with two decimal places. Now our math formula, which is new minus old over old, or the current row minus the previous row. So to get the current row, I can simply reference the average yearly earnings, that's our new value, minus our old value, or the previous year's earnings, and all of that will be divided by the previous year's earnings. So no, let's save that. And there we go. We quickly found 
a percent change year over year in the earnings of those with bachelor's degrees or higher. So we can see some little dips kind of around the recession. Makes sense. Uh, yearly earnings weren't growing that much then. And it looks like mid-90s was a really great time to have a bachelor's degree because you were getting quite an increase at that time. So this is helpful, but it could be more helpful. So I want to see more of a trend, you know, not just individual year changes. I want to see, has the trend been increasing? Is it growing quicker, your average yearly earnings, if you have a bachelor's degree? So I'm looking for a little more of like a running total of these values. And I think I can do that with a table calculation. So my first thought is to check, well, maybe there's a built-in table calculation for that. Add another calculation. I'm hoping to calculate a running total of percent change. Again, I'd like to give this a little more detailed explanation at the end, probably, percent change of yearly earnings, just so that everyone is clear on what I'm finding. I still want this to be a percent because the percent change is percentage. And again, I'm hoping that, aha, indeed there is a built-in running total formula. We can always jump to the Looker documentation using this help and syntax reference, and you can search there, or you can just search in the actual calculations modal to see if your uh, function is built in. So what do I want a running total of? I want a running total of that percent change in yearly earnings. So let's save this and see if it's what we expect. All right, so one thing I notice here is this is indeed a percent change in yearly earnings, and it's doing a running total on it, but it's doing a running total down the table, which is not quite what I was looking for. Because my year order sorts the, uh, the oldest year at the bottom and the most recent at the top, I want it to be running the opposite direction. I could go ahead and change the sort order in order to match my running total, but then I'd have to make some adjustment, adjustments here because remember we used offsets, which is grabbing the row below. I think, we can, I think we can get what we want in a table calculation. We want a table calculation that finds a running total going up the table. So what I wanna do is grab this row and add it to any rows below. So in this case, it would be nine plus null, 13 plus nine, and so on and so forth, running up. And let's start a new table calculation. So I do happen to know, and we'll call this reverse running total. I'm not gonna apply a formatting just yet, and you'll see why in a moment. So I know there's this function called offset list. And what offset list does is it will grab the, current, the row that I tell it to grab and any values that came before it, and it'll list them all together. It takes three inputs. It takes a column, which in this case we want to be the percent change in yearly earnings. It takes a row offset and a number of values. So for that row offset, I want to start with the current row and add anything that came before it. So I'm gonna give it a row offset of, one, of zero because remember, offset zero means start on the current row. For the number of values, well, I know there's a maximum of 12 values in my table. So I'm gonna go ahead and set this as 12. If we were working with say daily data and we wanted to do an offset list of the previous seven days, we could set this to seven and it would grab the current row and the seven values before it. But in this case, I've got 12 years of data, so I'm gonna go ahead and set that as 12 and see if this is what I want. Now be prepared, there's about to be a lot of decimal places. And see, told you there would be. So this does look like it's getting me what I want. If you can set aside the, the many decimals for the moment, I have no values on the bottom, because there was no percent change for that year. I have 9% in this row, 9, 9 and 13% on the next row, and so on up until my most previous year where it includes all of the previous values. So we could move forward with this 
and be happy with it. But something's kind of nagging me in the back of my head, which is I had to hard code in that value of 12. And what am I supposed to do when 2018 comes in? Do I have to manually update that to 13 values? I think we can come up with something a little more dynamic. So I'm going to pause on this section while I think about how can I get that dynamic number. So if I have 12 rows, then I have 12 values. 13 rows would be 13 values. It looks like I want to be referencing the row number in my number of maximum values that I get. So let's add another calculation to test. And I'm going to call this testing number of values. This is something I'll be able to delete later because it's not really relevant to the end report, but I just want to use it to be able to work out this dynamic value here. So there's a built-in row function which returns the current row value. I'm going to save that as a decimal and just show you what that looks like real quick. So here we go. On row number one, it's giving me one. On row 12, it's giving me 12. You may notice that this calculation appears to the left this time. That's because I'm not doing any kind of real calculation on it. There's no sums or averages being applied here. I'm just returning the row number. So this is being treated as a dimension. But that's fine for right now because we're not really planning on using this calculation in the end. What I really want to do is grab this maximum number because once my next year's data comes in, that will update to give me the maximum number of rows. So going back here, I can update that I want the max row number. Saving along the way is so important because you can see are you getting the value you want, and it can really help troubleshoot more complex table calculations like the one we're currently doing. So I took the maximum of the row number, which was 12. And I know that this will dynamically update, so when I have 13 rows, it'll grab the number 13, which is what I wanted for my reverse running total. Let's go back to the calculations modal. And this time, instead of referencing that here, I'm going to go ahead and copy this logic because this is not something I want in my end report, so I'll probably remove it. So once again, the offset list is going to take the percent change in yearly earnings, starting on the current row, and add up all of the previous values up until the total number at the top. So let's go ahead and remove this testing because we were done with that. That got us what we needed. And save this table calculation. Now, I don't see any change here, which is exactly what I wanted. It's still going up to 12 values at the top but I'm tired of looking at this massive list of values, so let's clean that up. What we're looking for is all those listed values to be added together. So I want to do a sum of that list so that the bottom row is adding up 9 and then 9 plus 13 and then 9 plus 13 plus the next value and so on. Now I can apply my formatting which we're still working with percent changes, so that's going to be a percent. Save my table calculation, and my Explorer looks so much better now. So what we've done is we've created a reverse running total that runs up the column, which is what I was looking for. So we can have the built-in running total, which runs down, or our reverse, which uses the offset list, running up. And we can see it looks like there's pretty steady growth over the years. Again, that jump in, jump in the mid to late 90s and then a little slowdown up here. But now we can quickly see that no matter where you are in time, having a bachelor's degree or higher is going to earn you more money. All right. So I'm going to jump back into our slideshow for just a moment. That was using offset functions to run row over row comparison so we know how to move up and down the data table. Now I want to talk a little bit about pivot functions or column over column comparisons. I have a simple example here, which you'll notice looks pretty similar to our regular offset, except this time it's a pivot offset. 
it takes the column we want and an offset. So I gave it an offset of one, meaning this will grab the values from one column to the right. Let's take a look at this in action. So jumping back into Looker, we are going to open up a new explore and look at some pivoted values. So let me break down kind of what we're looking at here. We've been looking at the financial status of certain generations, and I want to know how does where that generation lives have an effect on their income. Metropolitan living expenses tend to be much higher than rural ones, so let's determine which generation has the highest percentage of people living in metropolitan areas. In my explore, I brought back the generation name. I'm not really worrying about education at the moment. We could always bring that back later if we're curious. But right now I'm looking at just generation names and their metropolitan status, which is broken out into three columns, metropolitan, non-metropolitan, and not identified. My measure here is the number of people who live in each area. So I want to find the percent who live in metropolitan areas, which means I'm going to have to take this column and divide it by the total number of people in each generation. We'll start by getting the denominator of our percentage, which is the total number of people in each generation. Now this could be done with a row total, but I want to show you how it's possible to do with pivoted functions in table calculations as well. So, like we've done before, we're going to add a new table calculation. I'm going to call this total number of people because what I want is to add up the number of people in each generation across the columns. There are no partial people here, so let's do decimals with zero decimal places. And we're going to use the Pivot, so if I start typing pivot, I can see all of my pivoted options. We'll dip into some of these in a bit. But I want to use pivot row, which what that does is it grabs all of the values across the table that have been pivoted. And I want what I want to add up is the, using a dollar sign to pull it up, number of people. So Let's take a look at what this does. Again, it's invaluable to save your steps along the way. That's how we liked to troubleshoot crazy calculations on chat. If someone thought, oh, this isn't quite what I expect, what's going on? We'd break out each single part into its own table calculation to see what might not be what we expect. So we're going to save this. And, oops, you can see what happened. I forgot to apply. Oh, I did apply formatting. There we go. Apologies. What it's doing is it's adding or it's listing out all of those different values. So this was what I expected. I was a step ahead of myself in my head. What I really want to do is add these up. So it's just listed kind of across. Notice how it's similar to what we used for offset list, which listed the values below. This is listing the values across. But I want to kind of add those up as a list. They're not giving me what I needed. And save that. And there we go, much better. So here we have our pivoted number of people and the total number for each row. And this will be the denominator of our percentage calculation. So now that we have the denominator, we want to grab the number of people who live in a metropolitan area or the values from this column. There are a couple ways we could accomplish this, but I want to highlight a personal favorite calculation of mine, which is the pivot where. I feel like it's overlooked and needs its time in the sun. So we could use a pivot index function for this and say grab the first value, but I'll show you in a moment why we want to use pivot where instead. So let's open up our calculation and add a new one. And I'm going to call this oops, number of people in metropolitan areas. This is decimal zero. And I'm going to start. I know I'm working with a pivot function. So pivot functions in general help us return values from a pivoted column. In a 
pivot where? It works kind of similarly to an if function, where I need to give it an expression that can be either yes or no, and then what I want to do if that value is yes. There's not actually any no condition here, so we just need two inputs. In this case, I want to pivot where the metropolitan status is equal to metropolitan. And I, that's a string, so I should be wrapping that in quotes. Notice that red highlighting is telling me that I have an open quote and I need to finish it. There we go. Now that I have quoted that, it recognizes it's checking the string metropolitan. Excellent. So if the metro status is metropolitan, then give me the number of people. I'm not really caring about any other condition here. And let's save this and see if that's what we expect. And indeed, there it is. We've grabbed our number of metropolitan people for each generation. And as I mentioned before, this could be done with a pivot index, in which case I'd tell it grab from the first pivoted column with a pivot index of one. But if I or someone who's viewing my report changes that sort order, then the pivot index would have changed. In this case, because I've told it to pivot where the, the metropolitan status is metropolitan, that value will not change as I change the sort order. So we're good, good on that. I have my numerator, which is the number of people in each metropolitan area. I have my denominator, which is the total number of people, and I'm ready to combine that into a percentage. We're gonna add another table calculation and I'm gonna call this a nice clean name so everyone can know what I'm finding, percent of population living in a metropolitan area. Because I'm finding a percent, let's make this a percent. And in the previous examples, we've been referencing our calculations down here so I could you know, find the number of people in metropolitan areas and divide it by the total number of people. And that would get me what I want. But I wanna show that we can combine all of this logic into a single table calculation. So I can take the number of people in a metropolitan area and divide that by the total number of people in each generation. So if I do this, I could remove both of these calculations and this would still function. As we mentioned, any field used in a table calculation needs to be in the explore. So if I deleted these and I was using them somewhere else, I might get an error. But with this, it's just gonna be a clean single function. Let's save that. And there's our percentages. So we can pretty quickly pick out that millennials and Generation X are more likely to live in a metropolitan status. I wouldn't say it's quite as dramatic a change as I thought. So maybe I'd want to go ahead and at some point bring in education level and dive in and see does that affect because although it's clear that they are more likely to live there, it's not a super dramatic change. All right, I'm going to hop out of this pivoted explore and back into our presentation. So today we covered some of our favorite looker table calculations that can be quite helpful when you need to do advanced calculations in your explore. We covered if functions, which can be used to narrow down data based on a condition. So if this, then return the values. We can use a variety of offset and pivot functions to grab values from up and down or across the table. And we also covered some of my favorite tips and tricks from the chat team, which we used to break down table calculations. So using the dollar sign to list available fields in the data table can really save time if you have a lot going on. And breaking out each component of the calculation to test can help ensure that you are getting the value you expect. That's the end of our presentation, and we'll now open it up to questions. 
Um, Mayor, what questions have we been getting throughout the session? Hey, Emma. Uh, we've had quite a few questions, so I'll, uh, I'll go through and um, pick out just a few. So a couple people have asked, and maybe you can go through a little bit more of an explanation of how you got to, um, in your offset list calculation, how you got that to start at the very last row of the data set. Um, a few people have raised to that question. Absolutely. Let's go back to that explore. So just a moment while I jump back in. So is our question, how did we get this to start at the very first or the very last? The very last row, yes. So that dynamic calculation that you were able to set up there. Ah, absolutely. That definitely involves a couple of steps. So what I wanted to do was start on my current row and offset list, remember, takes a couple of inputs. So it takes the row I want to start on, so I always want to start on the current row, and list up to the total number of values that came before it. So I'm going to remove this sum for just a moment so we can see, again, how that broke out into the different values. So, uh-oh, do I have a mismatch in my bracket somewhere? Let's go with, there we go, number of brackets. Oh, it gets me, okay. So here we are again with that massive list of values. I've told it, have your first value start on the row you're on. In this case, that was null for the bottom row. And add up any values that came before. Notice all these tick marks here. That means that it's looking for up to 12 values that came before. Because I told it, I want a maximum number of 12. So up at the top, we're adding up all the 12 values that came before it. And what I want to do is give that calculation the, max, the number that I want to go up to. So I could hard code that as 12, or let's, for a simpler example, let's do working. So saving that. Now we can see that each time it's taking the current row, and if there are three values before it, it will add them up. So this one didn't, only had no values before it. This one had two before it. And now that we get up to here, we can see, although I apologize, it's in tiny decimal form, that this is taking the current row. It's taking the row before. And it's taking the row before that, up to three values. But because at my top I had 12 values that came before, I wanted to set that as a total of 12 values. We can always do this if you were working with monthly data and you wanted the previous year. 12 would be perfectly fine to have hard-coded in here. And this does get us the value we wanted. But my problem was once 2018 comes in, there's going to be 13 values. So if I'm only adding up 12, then I'm going to be missing a year. So to get around that, we had our test calculation calling in testing number of rows. I'm assuming a number of row will be a whole number. And I used, I started with the row function, which is going to return my current row. So row functions by themselves may not tell you that much because it's available over here, but they're very helpful for these sorts of calculations where you need to show the number of something in the table. So because I need to add up 12 values when there are 12 values, or when I need to add up 13 values when there are 13 values, I can go ahead and use this row number. Now, one thing to note, this is probably not you know, ideal, but I could always set this as like 100 values. So that if there were 100 value, you know, 50 values in the table, it would make sure to add them all up. But that's not, that's not quite as clean as I'd like it to be. I want to be able to have this match the number of values in my table. So what we did was we took the highest row number using the max function. There's built-in max, min, all types of functions to use. And what that got me back over here was the total number in my table. So 
this tells me how many values should I add up for the offset. And so I took that logic and inserted it here so that I will always add up up to the top row in my data table. Handy little function using max. So it didn't change that. And we can once again take our, our sum of all these values to clean things up a little bit. So using row numbers to reference the number of values in my table dynamically changing up to the top row. So telling it to take, starting with this row, grab the 12 values before. Hopefully that answers Perfect. your question. Thanks, Emma. Um, I think that was a really good explanation of the, the row number and getting that dynamic row number again. Um, another question that's come through, and this is related to the row offset, is how that mm -hmm. offset is determined. So in essence, um, is the sort important when it comes to using those row offset functions? Ah, that is an absolute fantastic question. I feel like I've gotten that question multiple times on chat. So thank you for bringing that up. Yes, the offset is very important, or the sort order is very important when you're doing this. So I want to actually remove some of these in order, maybe I'll start, maybe I'll start a new explorer. So in case we need to go back to that, we can. So I'm going to go ahead and load that explorer back up and show kind of how the sort order changes. So let's, let's remove some of these. Because the only one I'm really interested in right here is, ah, so notice when I removed that, I had a couple of calculations break. And that's because I was referencing the one I just deleted in both of these. That's why I recommend while you're testing and editing to have everything split out. But once you're happy with your end result, copy and paste all that logic into one clean function. So right now, really what I wanna just look at is this offset, which we used to find the previous year's earnings. So if I change the sort on the election year, you can see that now what we're returning is not the previous year's earnings, but the next year's earnings. So for 1994, I'm returning the previous year's as 1996. So yes, sort order does matter when you're using offset. It's something to keep in mind that if, some, if you or someone who's doing your explore is changing this, that that could have an effect. We can combat some things like that. There's not quite an offset where function yet, which would probably be quite helpful for that. But we can combat something like that with a pivot where so that when the sort order here is changed, it doesn't affect what I'm pivoting on versus if I'd used like a pivot index. So excellent question. Yes, offset does affect it. If I was really determined to have 1994 at the top and run it down to 2016, let's say I wanted to use my normal running total, not the reverse, I can make an adjustment to this. So I can open up my calculation. I deleted all the other ones. It's pretty clean in here right now. And I can change this to an offset of negative one. And let's take a look at what this does. So now what this is, what I'm telling it is grab the value from the row above. So for 1994, grab that value above. For 1998, grab that value above and so on. So if you really need to change the sort order on a report, you can certainly do that and just alter the offset to match. And I think we have time for, for one more question if we've got another one. Yes. I think just one more, um, and this will maybe be a little bit quicker. It's a conceptual question. So throughout mm -hmm. the webinar, you've been breaking down a lot of the table calculations for troubleshooting. Um, so a question came through from a performance standpoint. Is it better to break things down and then use the referencing that you used? Or is it better to just create one giant table calculation like you were doing and showing at the end? Right, that's an excellent point. So 
So I would recommend combining them into a single one at the end, and the reason being that table calculations are run on the front end, and so they render in the browser. And if anyone's ever done this before where you have a ton of columns in your browser, that can slow down not the performance of the query, because remember, these are not sending to your database. This is just running off what's in the table. So it wouldn't affect how quickly the results return, but it might slow down your browser if you have a bunch of columns because that's all rendering on the front end. So break it apart to do all, all of the testing. So you know, make sure that the numbers are what you expect and they're pulling together what you expect. And then at the end, kind of like we did here, copy that logic and put it into a single calculation. So once I remove these, I'll have no effect on that last percentage, and I can get a little bit cleaner of an explorer. Fantastic. Thank you, Emma. Um, I'm still seeing some other questions come through, so I, I know there's a few unanswered here. Uh, we'll try to follow up with you all afterwards if you had questions that we weren't able to get to. Um, but that's all the time we have for today. Thank you all so much for joining. Uh, we will send out this recording via email afterwards, so you will have that. Feel free to rewatch it to pick up additional tips. Uh, to test things out, share with your teammates. And then we do have four additional webinars included in this series. And our next one coming up is next Wednesday, and that will cover visualization and dashboard design best practices. So we hope to see you all there. Have a great day, everybody.